In today's podcast, we are going to discuss how Mercedes and Lewis Hamilton failed to win the race, how Kimi Raikkonen took his first win in five years, and look at how great Max Verstappen was, and also review how the midfield teams did at the US Grand Prix. Right, so here we are, guys, for the United States Grand Prix podcast. And again, as ever, here with Niblo. How are you doing after that crazy and great race? I am doing very well, mate. How are you doing? Yeah, I'm doing fine after what was, again, just a, a mega race yesterday. But now let's get into this review and first go on to Mercedes, who could have won the race of Lewis Hamilton, but they absolutely destroyed, uh, did Mercedes, their rear tyres on Lewis Hamilton's car, forcing him to pit... Uh, more than once, and that's what cost him victory. Because I think if the Mercedes did not hurt its tyres so much, Lewis would have took a dominant win and probably would have won the championship as well. Valtteri Bottas wasn't that good, really. And I think Mercedes, in terms of race pace, for once, Nib, weren't really there. Yeah, Ferrari, for once, were actually the quickest in the race for the first time in a while. Mercedes certainly didn't have the pace this weekend, but Hamilton, as Lewis Hamilton does, you know, just puts it on pole by six hundredths or whatever it was. And, yeah, I still thought he had a good race. There wasn't much he could have done, but one of the things I think he could have was pushing so hard after he made his first pit stop to catch Kimi Raikkonen back up because he even admitted himself that his tyres were dead after he caught up to Kimi. And then obviously sitting behind Kimi, that would have hurt his tyres a lot. So Hamilton could have played a bit smarter, that's for sure, during the race. But it was still a good performance. But probably Mercedes' most disappointing weekend uh, in a little bit of time, probably since Spa. So... But obviously, they're going to win the title next weekend, so there's no real major concern for Mercedes at all. Now we'll go on to the Scuderia Ferrari team, and what a result for Kimi Raikkonen, his first win in five years. What an emotional moment it was for him to win at the US Grand Prix. Just what a great moment, and it's probably going to be his last win in F1, so for everyone listening and everyone who you know tuned in for that race save that moment in your mind because it's going to be quite a famous moment when we look back in you know 10 years time it's again it was such an emotional moment at Cota but for Sebastian Vettel again bottling it first off with Daniel Ricciardo hitting Ricciardo at turn 13 on the exit understeered wide hit Ricciardo off the track and spun it was clearly Vettel's fault. He didn't deserve a penalty for it, but it was clearly his fault. Nib, what did you think of Raikkonen winning his first race in five years? And for Sebastian Vettel, just why does he keep bottling it? With Ferrari, well, what a, what a turnaround. They've taken four months of upgrades off of the car. They've returned their car to how it was before the summer break and it was when it was at Silverstone. And, well, what a performance by Ferrari this weekend. Back where they should be. They showed that they really did have the pace. And what an absolute superb drive by the Kimster on, on Sunday. He was absolutely superb. Defended brilliantly against Hamilton when Hamilton caught him uh, towards the end of Kimi's first stint. And he thoroughly, thoroughly deserved to win this race. We all thought Ferrari had bolstered up the strategy, but in the end, it, it was a masterstroke by Ferrari. What, what did you really think about the, the strategy that Ferrari did? I, I still think it was a bit lucky. I, I don't think Ferrari thought that Hamilton would suffer such bad tie wear. Maybe they thought because Lewis was having to try and fight past Kimi, maybe his tyres would be a bit older towards the end, but I don't think there's any way... Ferrari thought Hamilton would have to pit again. I think they were kind of thinking, you know, Lewis's tyres are now a bit more damaged than he would want to. So now we can just push and hopefully by the end of the race, when Lewis's tyres are a lot older, maybe get closer. But I don't think they thought um, 
I don't think they thought that Lewis would be pitting again. No way. Well, they did say during the race that Hamilton is on a two stop because Hamilton did pit very early for soft tyres. The pit window opened up about lap 16 to lap 20. That's when you should really pit for soft tyres. So it was about five to ten laps too early, and those five to ten laps were certainly a big um, hampering on Hamilton's race, and that's why he did have to pit again. And with Sebastian Vettel, well, I don't know what's happened to the great full-time world champion that we that we used to have. He's, he's a shadow of his former self at the moment. He could have quite comfortably had pole, but he, he made a slight mistake at the last corner, which cost compared to Hamilton you know there's not some, that that just happens can't blame him too much for qualifying but in the race I don't know what he was doing quite quite frankly it, it, just another horrific two late on the brakes understeering moment when he when he initially got past Ricardo comfortably and then he locked up his rears a little bit went wide and allowed Ricardo the opportunity to get back alongside and then yeah, he just understeers straight into Ricardo. Ricardo left the biggest amount of room. There's there's an image that's been going around on Twitter when they're side by side, and it looks like Ricardo's literally going to go off of the track to give Vettel that much space. Um, and somehow he still managed to crash into him. So who knows with Vettel at the moment? It, he needs this season to end as quickly as possible just so he can move past this season and look forward to 2019 because, well, this has been an absolute horror show for him this year. I think in the last two races, he's lost 33 or something positions on the first lap or whatever it is. Now, drop down to 15th. It's it's just not good enough by a four times world champion. This is what you'd expect from I know, Roman Grosjean, you know, obviously he still made his mistake this weekend, which we'll get onto a bit later, but it's Sebastian Vettel, supposedly one of the greats of the sport, but he's certainly not showing it at the moment. Now we'll move on to Red Bull, and with Max Verstappen, clearly he was the driver of the day on Sunday, starting in 18th and finished second and almost got a race victory. What a performance. This may be one of his best drives so far in his young career. I can't believe he was that good. I thought he would get probably into or close to the top five, but I did not think he would be that close, uh, you know, to winning the race or even be on the podium. But he was so, so good in the US Grand Prix. So for Red Bull, it was a good race. But for Daniel Ricciardo, again... Reliability problems. Uh, Nib, I know you're, you're still very angry and probably sad about this, so I'm not going to subject you to too much of this, but just share your thoughts on another Renault reliability issue. Well, let, let's start off with the positive here, and that, that was Max Verstappen this weekend. He was very, very good. He got stopped by the, the stopper curve, which is... <laughs> Quite, quite funny by uh, the Circuit America's Twitter account, which they posted that out over the Grand Prix weekend, and that it actually stopped him, which is, yeah, very funny. But, wow, what a drive. He's so, so good on his taxes. I don't think anyone would have expected the super soft tyres to last that long, but it was a shame as they did start to go off towards the end of the race, he said. That's why he couldn't challenge Kimi. But yeah, certainly driver of the day. I don't think there can be any doubt, even though Raikkonen was very good. It, Max was brilliant again, as as we've been pretty much saying the whole second half of the season. Max Verstappen and brilliant. But, 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 and a big but. Mr. Ricardo, another bloody retirement. I am, I am absolutely over this, you know. I stay up all night, the race is on at 5am, and then I want to throw my TV remote through the TV because Ricardo's retired again. Um, Christian Horn has confirmed that it's the exact same issue as Bahrain with the energy store, just a complete shutdown of power. 
And now I'd like to go through um, some stats here from, uh, from USA last year. So at the United States Grand Prix in 2017, he DNF'd with an engine. At Mexico, he had a 20-place grid drop. And then, of course, DNF'd with, an, with a blown-up engine. In Brazil, with Red Bull's engine power significantly hampered, because they had to turn it down, he finished sixth. In Abu Dhabi, DNF, hydraulics. Australia, a clean weekend, hooray, P4. Bahrain, DNF, electronics. China, P1. But, of course, his engine blew up in practice three, and it was very lucky to get out in qualifying. Red Bull did a fantastic job. In Baku, he DNF'd after the collision with Max. Not reliability for once. At Spain, he finished P5. No reliability issues. Hooray. Monaco, ERS failure in the race. If it was at any other track, he would have had to retire from the race. But because it was Monaco, he finished first. Canada, P4. France, front wing failure, P4. Austria, exhaust failure, DNF. Britain, P5. Germany, 20 grid place penalty. Oh, yeah, and guess what? He DNFs because his engine blows up. Hungary, P4. Belgium, DNF. It was a... There was no reliability issue, though. Um, it was collision when all that chaos happened at turn one. Italy, 30 place grid spot penalty. DNF with the clutch problem. Singapore, P6, which was quite a disappointing weekend. Russia, 40 place grid penalty. P6. Japan, car, fa car failure during qualifying. P4. And then, of course, at the US Grand Prix, a DNF with another engine issue. It's not good enough. And I need to stop before I absolutely go off. I think I think I've said what I needed to say here. Well, uh, after that rant, I think it's now time to get on to the midfield. And first off, let's go to McLaren. Not much to talk about. McLaren, again, very slow. Fernando Alonso was took out on the first lap by Lance Stroll. And Stoffel van Dorn, even though he wasn't miles off, say Ericsson and Hartley, who finished in the points, he did, I think, get a bit lucky from, you know, Ocon and Magnussen being disqualified and also some retirements. So even though he finished P11, which is a good result, he was a bit lucky to get that. Uh, Nib, any thoughts on McLaren? No, not really. You know, they brought a little revised front wing update. It did nothing. Shock, because all of their upgrades have done absolutely nothing this year. When they've even brought any upgrades, which have been very rare. But yeah, as usual, McLaren showed up and they went home empty-handed. So, not too much to discuss here with McLaren. Obviously, Alonso taking out the first lap. Then, yeah, the, the stuff all didn't do too much. Nearly got a point, as you mentioned. But yeah, that's... Not much to say about McLaren. All that's needed to be said over the last few weeks has been said. They're, they're a joke of their former self. They were slower uh, this year than they were last year, which is just a disgrace. I remember when Alonso put in that great lap last year, but oh, they're, they're awful. I think the less said, the better with McLaren. Next up is Renault. What a race this was for Renault on Haas's uh, turf. Sixth and seventh, and basically because of Haas's disaster of a Grand Prix, now Renault have basically confirmed fourth in the constructors. So even though it's not confirmed as uh, as of yet, basically it is over, and I'd have to say it is deserved. Renault have been better than Haas at getting, you know, the results needed. Haas have had the faster car but have just bottled great opportunities, in my opinion, compared to Renault Nib. Surely this performance will make you a bit more happier going into 2019 um, for your guy, Daniel Ricciardo. Yeah, certainly. This has been Renault's best weekend in, in in probably about four or five races now. I can't remember the last time they, they properly had a good result like this with Nico Hockenberg in 6th and Carlos Sainz in 7th. Obviously, Carlos Sainz had his little um, issue when he track extended at Turn 1. Uh, I'm not too sure how I feel about that. I, I felt as if he did deserve a penalty, but 
I think if he did try to stay on the track, he he might have got a tap on the rear end, so he just wanted to make sure. So, yeah, I, I think the penalty was fair, but, yeah, on enemy turf, Renault have done and got the job. We've got, got 14 points from this weekend, and now it looks like they definitely get fourth position over Haas. Um, but, yeah, what did, what did you think on the Carlos Sainz penalty? I think with the science penalty, it was fair. Uh, looking at the replay, I don't think there was a car close enough to push him right off the track. So, you know, he didn't really have an excuse, in my opinion, from that way. Um, and he gained a position on the forcing of Esteban Ocon by going off the track. If he stayed on the track, he would not have passed Ocon down into turns two and turn three. So for me, definitely a fair penalty. And it's nice to see, by the way, the stewards, after what was a joke last year, nice to see that they are actually coming down on these track extensions and corner cutting, despite, I think, is it turn nine? Um, Yeah, everyone is track extending at that corner, but it's nice to see them being more strict because, again, last year at Cota was just an absolute joke. Yeah, I absolutely agree with you there. The the track extending... I remember what, watching some onboard from Ricardo, and he just completely cut one of the first. It's like, if you do that in F1 game, you're getting a three-second penalty. Sometimes the F1 game's more, more strict than real life. But, yeah, it is a pity that they still track extend to Narnia out of uh, turn nine. But, yeah, the fair, I agree with that. A fair penalty for science. And, yeah, this result certainly does fill me with a little bit more hope. Hopefully they can get a little bit closer to the top three teams. But um, I'll firmly say once again, hashtag believe in Renault. Now we'll go on to Force India, who in terms of the race result they got initially, 8th and 10th, it wasn't that spectacular. It was still a good result, but it wasn't it wasn't that great. I thought they should have been a bit better than that, but that's what they got at the time. But then Esteban Ocon was disqualified for exceeding the fuel flow limit. At the start of the Grand Prix, Nib, just how much of a, even though that you know they're not seriously competing, you know with Renault and Haas, how much of a disaster is this, considering that if things go awry in the last couple races, you never know they might finish behind McLaren if they continue to waste points. Oh, I don't think it's too much of a disaster here for NDL, but. They've still got some, some good points out. Scored McLaren still with Perez finishing eighth. But, yeah, with Ocon, same issue that Ricardo had at Australia back when he had got the podium taken away from him, exceeding the fuel, the fuel flow limit. So a bit disappointing there for Ocon because he, he did do a good drive this weekend. Um, but, yeah, I'm not, not too concerned about forcing the I still think that they will finish comfortably ahead of McLaren in the constructors. So not too much cause cause for concern, but they they weren't on TV at all really during this this race with Force India. They were absolutely nowhere. I think Ocon had a little bit of contact with Claire, I think it was, in the first sector, end of first sector. I think I remember seeing on on the broadcast. So... But thankfully, nothing happened out of that. But yeah, pretty meh weekend for Force India. And next up is Williams, who had a usual just nothing e type race. But the only thing that did happen that is of note is Lance Stroll taking out Fernando Alonso. And Nib, what was Stroll thinking? There was not a gap there to go for an overtake, but he thought, why not? I'll just put my car in there when that gap was always going to close. Yeah, I'm, I'm not too sure what Lance Stroll was thinking. He, he does like to be over-aggressive. He, he was basically all four tyres nearly off the track to try and get past Alonso. And then I think one of the funniest moments of the race where David Croft said, oh, and that's Alonso just turning in on Stroll. I'm like, are you mad, Crofty? Are you mad? What are you on? But uh, I, no- I noticed in the race highlights they did a cheeky edit so that he didn't say that and make him look like a, a complete and utter fool. But, yeah, no- nothing really to say with Williams. They they 
ahead of um, Ericsson and Van Dorn in qualifying. That was good, but yeah, another just air weekend for Williams. And once again, same as my, they were slower this year at Code Art than they were last season. So that's an absolute disgrace. And hopefully we can see a, a bit better Williams um, next year. Now we're going to Toro Rosso. Pierre Gasly, who normally is the furthest forward going Toro Rosso driver, did not really have that great of a Grand Prix, finishing in P12 foot for Brendan Hartley with the disqualification of Esteban Ocon and Kevin Magnussen, finishes in ninth. And you know what? I think this was his best uh, race so far in his F1 career. He was just fantastic. His pace was great and completed... A very underrated move around the outside of Marcus Ericsson, I believe, at turn, I think, 8 or turn 7. A, a, an amazing overtake of that corner. I've never seen a car go right around the outside at that part of the track. And you know what? I think for the hard work he put in in that race to get up to P11, I think he deserves points, Nib. Yeah, definitely. Big up for my brother, Brendan Hartley, you know. He was fantastic in the race, you know, obviously... Having to start the back of the grid, he, he avoided all of the carnage well. And I might just suggest to everyone listening to the podcast, go, go and watch Brendan Hartley's um, first first lap on board footage. Well, he, he had a fantastic first lap. As you mentioned, that movie did on Ericsson, probably the move of the race. Well, wow, completely around the outside of turn eight or seven. can't remember which one it is, but he completely mugged Ericsson off like he wasn't even a proper F1 driver. He, it was a fantastic move, and he he comfortably beat Gasly this weekend by, in the end in the race, about 15, no, 25 seconds actually in the race. So fantastic by Hartley, and obviously got a bit lucky to get the points, but I felt as if he deserved some points today because maybe if he started a bit further forward, he might have actually got some points today. So I'll today the other day so yeah very good for Hartley and quite a positive weekend for Tor Russo even though they started at the back of the grid. Now we're going to the home team Haas and what a disappointing race it was they had to beat Renault they had to outscore them in terms of points but instead Grosjean retires in two laps and Magnussen is disqualified because uh, basically Haas overfilled the car and exceeded the fuel limit, just not good enough. First off, Roman Grosjean, clearly at fault in the incident with Charles Leclerc, deserves a three-place penalty for Mexico and is just two penalty points away from a race ban, so Grosjean needs to be careful. I think for Magnussen, he did do a good race, but the team, even if it was slightly over the limit, they broke the rules. So, yeah, just... Again, how disappointing, Nib, was was Haas's performance? Yeah, definitely. Some might say it was a disaster of a of a weekend, <laughs> but it was a good race by K Mag with all of the fuel saving which he had to do. As Haas have come out and complained, you know, Gunter Steiner coming out and having a having a suck really. You know, it's not fun to watch. Well. I don't know about you, mate, but this race was one of the best races to watch of the season. That's for sure. But I know next year they're upping the fuel limit, aren't they, by about five kilograms. So hopefully that helps out Haas and the issues with um, fuel saving. But with Roman Grosjean, oh, it, it, it was a case of 2012-2013 lap one Roman Grosjean just being silly and crashing into people. Usually it was Mark Webber, but this time it was unfortunately Charles Leclerc, and I think Leclerc could have got some points, so that's a bit disappointing. But with Grosjean, he just ruined his own race, and well, they completely, completely bottled this weekend. It was a very good opportunity to get some more points than Renault, and in the end, Renault come here with a, with fourteen more points than Haas, so. An absolute nightmare of a weekend for Haas. And finally is Sauber, who they could have got points, as Nib said, uh, they're with Haas with Charles Leclerc. 
but they didn't because Roman Grosjean returned to his lap one nutcase uh, persona, so disappointing for Leclerc, and I think he retired because of the damage uh, sustained with that contact with Roman Grosjean. Ericsson, at least he scored a point, but it was a very uneventful race, and in terms of pace, I don't think he actually deserved it, but there you go, he scored a point. Uh, Nib, do you have any final thoughts about Sauber? For Sauber, quite a disappointing weekend in the end. Obviously, Marcus Ericsson gets a point after the re the disqualification of Kevin Magnussen and Esteban Ocon, but even more disappointing for Charles Leclerc, who, when looking very good the past two race weekends, has got taken out by both the house drivers, which is, uh, yeah, not too surprising. But I think he definitely would have scored some good, valuable points this weekend, but... Sadly, that was not not to be. He had to retire from damage to the car halfway through the race. So hopefully Charles can get a clean race weekend in Mexico and hopefully show what um, some good form. But just some final thoughts on the race before we do end off the podcast. Um, thank you, Pirelli. I, hopefully this shows them that what happens when when we have tyres that degrade. This race was all made well and good because of the rear tyres degrading. Degrading tyres equals good racing. They got it absolutely bang on this weekend, so absolute kudos to Ferrari, and I'm not too sure if you want to say anything, but just some final thoughts on the race. Yeah, Pirelli did a great job in terms of the tyres. I do think um, with the track being fully wet for Friday, I think that's what created this race and the um, uncertainty when it came to the tyres. But there you go. I think Pirelli, yeah, I think their tyres just about uh, did the job. Before we get on to the questions, let's do some quick and early predictions for the Mexican Grand Prix. Now, I'm going to go for Max Verstappen to win because... If he was so close to victory after starting 18th and only being a second off Kimi Raikkonen, if he was so close to victory at Cota, at Mexico, which is going to suit the Red Bull a lot more, I don't see, unless Max you know, makes a mistake or gets hit by someone, I don't see how Max won't win the race. I think he's going to be so quick. Last year at Mexico, he dominated that race. He was so, so good. Put a great move on Sebastian Vettel to get the lead. Uh, so yeah, I'm going to go Max in first. I think Lewis will finish in second and take his fifth world title. Remember, Lewis has to finish seventh or higher to win the championship, regardless of what Vettel does. And in third, I'm going to say, you know, I'm just going to keep it at a Ferrari because I'm not sure which one it's going to be. I would say Vettel, but Vettel is throwing it away so much. I don't trust him to actually get a podium at Mexico. How unbelievable is that to say for a four-time world champion that I don't trust him to finish in the top three at a, a normal bog standard track, really? That is quite unbelievable uh, to say. But Nib, um, are you going for a same victor or are you going for someone or a different team for victory? I am indeed going with the same winner. I believe Max Verstappen will win the Mexican Grand Prix, followed by Kimi Raikkonen in second, because I the, the Kimster's in a good vein of form at the moment. It's, it is it is a pity, because I think he he kind of deserves to keep his seat at Ferrari. He's actually very well this season. Um, and then in third, this is very, very hopeful, and Ricardo's going to need some sort of Super, oh, I'll just expose that, haven't I? I think Ricardo's going to finish third. Um, I, I just want him on the podium, man. I want to I want to see the Shuey for the last time in, in Red Bull colours, the, the last Shuey for probably a few years, sadly. So, yeah, I think Ricardo will get third. Now to end this podcast, we'll get on to the questions, and the only questions are from DT2002. The first one is... Do you think next year is going to be decisive for Vettel if Charles Leclerc beats him? Yes, because if Leclerc in his first year at Ferrari, which is, you know, Ferrari is Vettel's team. If Leclerc comes in there and beats him, 
and wins the title, I think Vettel mentally is done. Because, I mean, he's been hammered mentally by Lewis for, what, two years now. He was beaten by Ricardo in 2014. That was a, uh, a hammer blow. So, if he gets beaten by Leclerc, I think mentally he's done in terms of winning championships. I don't think he'd be able to recover from that. I don't think he is strong enough to come back uh, from that nib. Do you agree? Do you think Vettel can um, turn it around if Leclerc does beat him? Um, and how decisive of a year is 2019 for Sebastian Vettel? Yeah, 2019 is probably going to be the biggest year in Sebastian Vettel. Can he turn it around? Can he turn around all of the horrific mistakes and bad luck that he has had over the past two years? But yeah, if if Charles Leclerc beats him, I think Vettel's absolutely dead in the pen, done, buried, and finished. So I hope for Vettel's sake that he does beat Leclerc. But obviously, I do like Leclerc a lot, and I hope he does well. But it, it's just, as I've, as I've been saying for the past few podcasts now, it's just such a shame to see a four-time world champion like this. That's for sure. But, yeah, very, very decisive year for Sebastian Vettel. And the final one is, what has been Lewis Hamilton's best moment of his season so far? And I think it's quite clear, it has to be Singapore. That lap in qualifying was one of the best laps I've ever seen. Uh, since I started watching F1 in about 2011. What a lap that was. And he annihilated the field that weekend also in the race. So, yeah, it has to be Singapore. Nib, do you agree? Or do you think maybe Monza? Or uh, maybe Hockenheim? Well, Hockenheim is definitely the moment which the title turned to Hamilton. But, yeah, I, I have to agree. It has to be Singapore. At Singapore, everyone expected Ferrari to come back strong. This is where Ferrari should be really good. They're good on high downforce tracks. And Hamilton absolutely blew everyone out the water with his lap. So, yeah, yeah, for me, it also has to be Singapore. And as you said, probably the best qualifying lap I have ever seen live. That's for sure. Absolutely incredible lap. And, yeah, Hamilton certainly does deserve this fifth world title that he should win next or this weekend coming right guys that's it for the podcast thank you guys for watching and as well thank you guys for 1.5k subs again it means a lot and hopefully the channel will keep growing and nib thank you very much for helping me out this weekend with modding in the chat and with being a part of the podcast as always mate yeah it's always a pleasure to record these podcasts with you i've always liked f5 with you so it's always great to do. But anyway, guys, that's has been it for this video. Don't forget to hit the like button and subscribe for more content like this. Don't forget, guys, I'll be back on Thursday with a Mexican Grand Prix preview. And as well, don't forget to join our Discord server, link below in the description, also with my Twitter and my website. Comment down below what you thought of this video and comment down below what did you think of what we discussed. Please comment down below what you think about those topics. And until next time, it's been me, Tazar HD. Goodbye.